Hi everyone, in this video I want to go through the process of selecting a topic and a purpose, or I should say a thesis statement, for your informative speech. And more specifically, I'm going to take you through the process of how you will go about generating a thesis statement for this speech and in terms of doing outside research, scholarly research from the library, how will you kind of incorporate that into a thesis statement. And I'm also going to go through some of the guidelines, things that you want to avoid with your thesis statement. We already, for our first speech, we had preview statements, which are very close to a thesis statement. So as we're going through this, you might sort of find yourself thinking like, this kind of sounds like the preview statement. And it does, but there's an additional quality to a thesis statement, and that is that it makes some sort of claim about uh, whatever it is that you're discussing. And we'll get more into that. I also want to say one thing I'll do in this video is clarify the textbook chapter on selecting a topic and a purpose, which I believe is chapter five. I'm going to clarify that for you because I believe personally that isn't very, it's kind of confusing to be quite honest. Generally speaking, I really think our textbook is a good one, but I do find this chapter a little bit overly confusing. So if you felt like that when you were reading it, then you're in good company and by the end of the video, it'll be much clearer. So let's get to it. If you go into Canvas here in modules, speech to assignment instructions, and the documents that I'm going to be using in this video, you can find here in this, this section, the rubric for the speech. I'm going to pull that up. And then also on here is selecting a topic and a purpose. And you go to this video thesis statement, central ideas, which is what you click to start this video. But more specifically, I'm going to be using this document that's linked in there. So make sure that you have that ready to go. So my advice to you all when you are going about starting your thesis statements, beginning your research, um, and in general writing a speech is to pick a topic that you find interesting because you are going to have to do outside research and spend some time learning about this topic. So it might as well be something that you find interesting and that you wouldn't mind spending time learning more about. So having said that, as I take you through this sample thesis generation process, I'm going to model that by picking a topic that I think is really interesting. And if I was going to give this speech, what would I give it on? And what I decided was to give my sample speech or whatever on the Ethel M. Chocolate Factory and Botanical Gardens. Because when I first moved to, when I first came to Las Vegas to interview for my job at CSN, I went to this Ethel M. Chocolate Factory and Botanical Garden just kind of on a whim as something to do, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it has such beautiful uh, cacti, and I enjoyed touring the chocolate factory, and I just thought it was kind of cute, and it really was a, kind of the first thing that, that sparked in me, like I can see myself living here. So why not? You know, I've got a good, strong, positive feeling about this place. I'd like to learn more about it. Why not give my speech about it? So that's what I encourage you to do. And so just for reference, what I've got these pictures here of the chocolate factory. The top ones are um, inside the chocolate factory. And you can see right here on the right side, it shows the people inside the chocolate factory putting stuff together, um, making the chocolates. And then right here, it's kind of like it's a hallway that you pass through when you're visiting. And then on the right side on the wall, there's all this kind of historical information about Ethel M. Um, chocolates and their relationship to um, Forest Mars or M for Mars, Mars bars, M for m and M. So this guy Forest Mars is he's a chocolatier and he it, is the name behind Mars bars and M&Ms and now Ethel M chocolate. So Ethel is Forrest Mars's mother and he creates this line of, of chocolates um, as an homage to his mother and I believe that they use the homemade recipe to make them. So all, I learned all that kind of touring the factory and reading the stuff on the sides 
And I thought, oh, that's, that's charming. How cute, you know? It's like his mom. So they're making the chocolates right here. So it felt they're all very home homemade to me. You know, that was kind of this local homemade kind of thing, feeling for it. And I was into it. And then on this side, you can see this glass. And, and you can actually, when you're touring, you can see the workers on, on the left side. And I think you can actually see one of them right there. But these are what you're looking at, these guys. And then outside the factory is this gorgeous cacti garden with tons and tons and tons of cacti. You know, it's not super big, but it's it's pretty large um, in relationship to the factory. So it's it's a nice botanical garden. It's free. And then at Christmas time, they, they deck it out in lights, and it's a beautiful place to go with family or take pictures, whatever. So this is just some background on FLM Chocolate Factory. Okay. So you've picked a topic that you're interested in, you're going to start doing some research. Here's the thing about creating a thesis statement is that a thesis statement makes a claim about whatever it is that you're talking about, and it also, it, it can, it usually will, also preview your main points. It will preview what you plan to discuss in the, in the essay or the speech in our case. So you can't know what your claim is going to be about this topic and you can't really preview your main points if you haven't done any research. So you don't have to do all of your research at first, but you do need to do some introductory research to get a sense of what it is you're talking about, to get a lay of the topic um, in order to create a thesis statement. All right, so you need to start your research process. And I'm going to do a whole video on how to use a library to research, um, but for now, know that you will be using scholarly articles and credible articles and resources to create for, for your research. So whatever, here I am going back to my Ethel M chocolate factory example and I you know I've seen the factory so I know a little bit about it and like I said I kind of have this idea in my head that oh maybe I'll focus my speech on how it's this like kind of local homemade homey kind of feeling situation. I, I'm not really sure. It's not very clear, but it's just sort of a uh, instinct that I have. And so I say, okay, and I'm going to start doing some research and maybe I can find more about that, you know, and I'm researching, I'm researching. And it's a really good idea when you're researching that whenever you find an article that you think is good or that has some information on it that you think you want to come back to, you want to save that article. Okay. And you want to keep track of what you find interesting in those articles. And I'm not going to show you everything that I found because that would take too long. Okay, but as I'm reading through these articles, and I would say this process took me about an hour, um, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and I'm writing stuff down. And one of the things I write down um, is that the cacti garden outdoors has 350 species of local and exotic cacti. And as I said, I was very taken, charmed by the cacti garden. And so um, I write that down. And I know that this article I got it from has more information on the cacti garden. And so I'm looking at other stuff. I'm clicking around. I'm seeing kind of sk skimming articles. And I, I find some other stuff. But another thing that I find that I had no idea when I toured the factory and the cacti garden is that the outside of it has a water waste treatment facility. And it actually takes the water waste from the factory and it treats it on site um, using, it doesn't use any chemicals at all, but it uses natural elements like snails, fish, protozoa, bacteria, and algae. And so I thought, well, that's cool. You know, they, they recycle the water, they use it for the garden, and they treat it on site in sort of a, sort of a natural, non-chemical way. And I thought that was also cool. And so I'm researching and I'm looking around some more and I'm writing stuff down. And finally I come across another interesting piece of information. And that is that the, the garden also has a solar garden on there, which I also didn't realize when I was looking at it because it's kind of off to the side so you can't really see it. And this solar garden that's on site actually provides energy to the chocolate factory uh, during peak hours of operation. So I didn't know any of that when I just, you know, toured it. And even though I had this idea in my head originally that I was going to focus on this local homemade, home-based feel of things, um, it turns out through the research process that a theme 
is emerging. Um, and you can see from these pieces that I selected is that I didn't realize that this this place was so environmentally friendly or that it had so many environmental initiatives. So that's kind of what this claim that I'm going to make about Ethel M. Chocolate Factory becomes, is that it has a lot of environmental initiatives. So from this, I am going to sort of weave this information into a thesis statement. And so this is what I come up with. And there's lots of different ways to do it, okay? But this is what I came up with in my head, okay? So my thesis statement, or as your textbook calls it, a central claim is, with its diverse cacti garden, its on-site water treatment facility, and its state-of-the-art solar garden, the Ethel M. Chocolate Factory and Botanical Garden in Henderson, Nevada, combines environmental features with a charming homemade character, all right? So this is my thesis statement. Um, and you can tell from it that my main points, I'm going to focus on these three things. I'm going to talk for one main point about this cacti garden and all that's involved in it. And I have more info on that, right? And then the second main point, I'm going to talk about its water waste treatment facility. And it's my third main point is the state-of-the-art solar garden. So the central claim that I'm making is that the Ethel M. Chocolate Factory combines environmental initiatives or features with a charming homemade character. And then these three main points substantiate that. So that's how I created my thesis statement. Now, if we go over here and we look at the rubric for speech two, and we're in the intro, introduction section, you can see right here that it's, I've got thesis statement and preview, previews the body as two separate things I'm scoring you on. So what I'm looking for in this speech is that you do have a thesis statement where you make a central claim. And for me, as a reminder, that central claim was that Ethel M. Chocolate Factory has these environmental initiatives. Okay, but then I'm also looking to see that you preview your main points. And the example I just showed you, I combined my central claim, my thesis statement, and the preview statement. I put it all together in one sentence. And some of you might want to do that in your speech. I would say it takes a little bit more work to combine it all into one sentence like that. You kind of have to play with the wording. Um, and it can kind of be a longer sentence. But there is a certain flair to combining it all in certain simplicity. Okay, so that's one option is to combine your thesis statement and your preview statement into one sentence. Another option though, and for this I'm going to pull up that document that it was linked. Some people might have a thesis statement and then a separate preview statement right next to each other. Okay. So here is the example of the thesis and preview statement combined that I just showed you. And then this one right here is, shows the thesis statement and the preview statement separately. Okay, so here I'll read this to you. For thesis statement, created by Forrest Mars, the Mars Bars and M&M Chocolatier, the Ethel M Chocolate Factory in Henderson, Nevada combines charming homemade character with environmental initiatives. Today, I'd like to tell you more about those environmental initiatives. By taking a look at Ethel M's beautiful cacti garden, its on-site water waste treatment facility, and its state-of-the-art solar garden. Okay, so I just, they're right next to each other. There's a very subtle difference. But either way, you want to have a thesis statement where you make some sort of claim, and also you want to have a preview statement where you let the audience know your main points like you did in your first speech. So let's go back to the Prezi, okay? And what I want to do now, as I promised, is to clarify some of the jargon that your textbook uses when they're describing thesis statements. Um, and I just kind of want to clarify some of it because you will be taking a quiz on this chapter. And so I do want you to do well in that quiz. And I want you to understand what the textbook is saying even though I think it's a little bit too complicated. Okay, so let's go through all these different terms that the textbook is giving uh, to you 
and ultimately with all these terms that they list, they're trying to funnel things down to ultimately help you to create a thesis statement. So it's trying to help you, um, whether it does or doesn't, that's kind of your opinion. But um, so they, they give you topic, general purpose, specific purpose, thesis statement, or as they call it, a central idea. And I have to tell you, I've never heard anyone call it a central idea. Um, it's almost always it's just called a thesis statement. So there's another element where they confuse you. Okay, but we'll get to that in a minute. So topic, um, the topic we kind of already understand that. For me, it was Ethel M. Chocolate Factory. For you, it could be anything in Las Vegas or Nevada, a person from Las Vegas or Nevada, or if you chose the other option, it might be a person or a place or an object that somehow had a really big impact on history. So however you're going to go about doing it, but the topic, you know, we understand that I think. Now this work starts getting a little confusing. The textbook tells you next that you have a general purpose and really all the general purpose is is just the type of speech that you're giving. You're either giving an informative speech or a persuasive speech. And so your general purpose is just taking that informative or persuasive and putting it in an infinitive phrase. And so an infinitive phrase is something that ha starts with the word, the to form. Okay, so to inform if it was an informative speech or to persuade if it was a persuasive speech would be your general purpose. So the infinitive phrase is just anything. It's like to walk, to run, to laugh, to cry. Those are all infinitive phrases. Um, but sometimes it's kind of jargony and it can be confusing. But that's all it is right there. It's either to inform or to persuade. And for us, we're giving an informative right now, so it would be to inform. So from there, they want you to get more, they're getting more specific. Okay, so you can tell they've gone from topic, which is super broad, to general purpose, which is a little bit more specific, and then they get into a specific purpose. And the specific purpose, they tell us, is a single infinitive phrase, so that's basically what we did up here. So you take the general purpose to inform, and then you include a reference to your audience, so that becomes to inform my audience. You just put those two together about and then from there, you tell the audience precisely, not generally, what you wish to accomplish in your speech. So for my speech sample, it would be to inform my audience about the environmental features of Ethel M. Chocolate Factory and Botanical Garden. So when it says right here, it communicates precisely not generally, what you wish to accomplish in your speech. That's important or useful to think about because if I had just said to inform my audience about Ethel M. Chocolate Factory and Botanical Garden, that wouldn't really be a specific purpose because I'm just sort of restating my topic. And instead, this specific purpose that they're telling us about, it is much more specific than the topic. All right, and then you can see that play out here because I say to inform my audience about the environmental features of Ethel M. Chocolate Factory and Botanical Garden. So from there, you've done all that work, and now, as I think the book's logic is like, now you're finally ready to create a thesis statement, or as they call it, a central idea. And they give you some rules for what, how you should form the thesis statement. Before I go through those rules, though, all this stuff that we've just taken us through, this topic, general purpose, specific purpose, keep in mind that I don't need you to, I don't need you to show me this in your speech. I'm never going to collect anything um, where you, or I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask you on your speech outline to tell me, you know, what's your general purpose, what's your specific purpose. All I want to know is what is your thesis statement. So I'm not even gonna ask you about this stuff, okay? So take it for what you will, you know, you're gonna be asked questions on the quiz about it, but as far as your speech goes, you really don't need to worry about it, okay? So we care about the topic and we care about the thesis statement. How you get there, that's your personal journey. So hopefully that helps to clarify some of this information. 
Now, the next thing I want to do is to go over some of these rules that the textbook gives you about how a thesis statement should look and sound. And these are, these are rules you should follow. So they give us four things that we need to remember. A thesis statement should be a declarative statement. It should be precise, so not general. That's like a topic, not a thesis statement. It should preview your main points, and it should avoid figurative and subjective language. So let's go through some of those. Okay, so a declarative statement. A declarative statement is you telling the audience that something is so. You can tell that something's a declarative statement if you tacked on the words, I declare, beforehand, and it still made sense, and it, it actually sounded like you were declaring something, then it would be a declarative statement. So I wouldn't, for example, say, I, let's say I'm giving a speech on nanorobots. I wouldn't be able to say, I declare what are nanorobots, because that is not a declaration, what are nanorobots? That's a question. Remember, a declaration is something you say with certainty, you know. It is something that is true, and you're about to back up that truth in your speech with these main points and your supporting materials. So don't ask a question in your thesis statement. Remember, the audience doesn't know what nanorobots are. Uh, the, the audience is waiting for you to tell them. So just cut to the chase in the thesis statement, and instead of asking what are nanorobots, find out the answer, and then that becomes your thesis statement. Okay, so you don't want to ask questions. You said you want to have a declarative statement. Another thing you want to do is avoid vague or subjective language. So vague vague statements, subjective language. I give a couple examples of that. I say, Ethel M Chocolate Factory and Botanical Gardens is an awesome place to visit. And what's the problem with this word awesome? Well, it's vague, right? We don't, what does awesome mean? You know, um, it can mean a lot of things. It's also very subjective. Um, wh when I say something's awesome, it might be very different from what you think is awesome. I could say instead that Ethel M Chocolate Factory and Botanical Gardens is a popular place to visit because popular is something that we can at least substantiate with facts, right? We could look at how many visitors Ethel M Chocolate Factory gets a year and we could determine through those numbers that it is popular. But we can't prove one way or the other that Ethel M Chocolate Factory is an awesome place to visit because that's totally subjective, right? And in fact, I sh in my example I showed you earlier, I said that the cacti garden was beautiful. And to be totally true to form, I should take out the beautiful part because beautiful is another subjective opinion, right? You, nobody can prove that something is or isn't beautiful. It all depends on the eye of the beholder. So you want to avoid any kind of language that's very subjective like that and can't be proven because this is what we're trying to do in the informative speech is to be really objective. So avoid, avoid subjective language. Here's another example that you want to also avoid figurative language. So figurative language is something that we say that's not actually literal. So for example, the campus policy on student parking really stinks. Now the literal understanding of stinks would be that it actually smells bad on the, the campus, or I'm sorry, that the campus policy on parking smells bad, which isn't what we mean when we say something stinks like that. We're, instead, we're using the phrase stinks as a figurative word, meaning like it's no good, it, it's not, you know, it's not the best, it needs improvement, whatever. So you don't want to use figurative language because figurative language, well, one, it can confuse people, but more importantly, it doesn't commune, it's sort of like a, it's like a shortcut, it's like a Weasley way out of forcing the speaker to actually say what they mean. If I say the campus policy on student parking really stinks, you guys understand that I don't think it's the best or that it needs improvement, but you really don't understand the specifics of why it needs improvement, what is actually wrong with it. 
because there could be a variety of things wrong with it that I'm not actually telling you by just saying, taking the shortcut of saying it stinks, right? It could be that I'm saying, you know, it's um, the, the, the parking, you know, needs that it's unsafe because there's no lights in it. It could be that it's too small because there's just not enough spots. It could be that there's too much traffic and they need to reroute the, you know, the direction waves or whatever. You don't know when I just say it stinks because that's so vague. So this is the reason why it's important to avoid figurative language, right? And it's also important to use literal language because again, the whole point of an informative speech is that the audience can check check what you're saying and, and determine if it's factual. If a person is always being figurative and using figurative language and someone says, that's not true, the campus policy on parking doesn't stink, then the, the, it's, the speaker kind of has like a way out of being like, oh, well, you know, I was just, I was just kind of, you know, being figurative. Um, whereas if the speaker is forced to say the campus, po the campus parking lot is not big enough for our school, then they've, committed to what they're saying and then the speaker and the audience can have a dialogue from there. That's a lot harder to do if you just use really vague, uh, figurative, subjective language. So here's an example of a thesis statement that's much more specific, literal, concrete language. All right, given its high cost for a parking pass, the lack of parking spaces, and the poor lighting in the lot, all future profits generated from parking permit sales should be exclusively earmarked marked for lot construction and lot maintenance only. All right, so this, I'm being way more clear about what I think is wrong with the parking lot. Um, you can tell what my main points are going to be, these three things right here. And I'm actually making some kind of claim about what's wrong and what should be done. This example right here is for persuasive speech, so we won't, you know, spend too much time there. But... Remember, you want to avoid figurative language, vague language, subjective language in the thesis statement. Okay, last thing I want to show you is this document, which I already pulled up once. And do take a look through it, because I kind of just take you through the process that I went through already. And then you can see how my Ethel M. Chocolate Factory example would sort of start to be an outline. So that's, that's good to look at. And then the last thing I want to take you through are some sample thesis statements, just if you want kind of some more ideas about how this would look. These are all examples from student speeches that I had using that Las Vegas, Nevada prompt, all right? And so you can tell with all of these, actually, they combined their thesis statement with their preview statement. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can tell, like, you should be able to tell what's the claim that they're making and what are the main points. So this one right here was on the downtown project and the speaker's thesis statement was, revitalizing the downtown area, the downtown project is a growing venture that encourages entrepreneurial business and provides ample entertainment for Las Vegas residences. So the downtown project is a growing venture. All right, that's their claim. It's a growing venture that revitalizes the downtown area. This is the claim that the speaker is making about the downtown project. And then this speaker's main points were that it is encouraging entrepreneurial business and that it's providing ample entertainment for Las Vegas residents. So they spent, they actually had two main points. They spent about half their speech talking about these new businesses that were coming to the downtown and also the entertainment that it provides. Here's another example on the Children's Discovery Museum. This speaker says, the Children's Discovery Museum's dedicated staff, two distinct departments, and wide variety of activities and attractions make it a popular Las Vegas destination for both children and adults, they should say popular, not attractive. So the topic is a Children's Discovery Museum. The claim that they're making about the Children's Discovery Museum is that it's a popular Las Vegas destination for children and adults. And they substantiate that claim by taking us through the features 
of the Children's Discovery Museum. It's dedicated staff, that's one main point. Two distinct departments is another main point. And then it's wide variety of activities and attractions is a third main point. Here's one more we'll go through. Zappos' unique set of core values, their charismatic CEO, and their funky company culture is what makes it a thriving 21st century online retailer. So topic is Zappos. Central claim is that Zappos is a thriving 21st century online retailer. And then they substantiate that claim with their main points. They have one main point where they talk about Zappos core values, another main point where they detail the charismatic CEO who runs Zappos, and then their third main point is that they go through and talk about the funky corporate culture that it has. And you can read through these other ones if you like, but you should be able to tell, like, this is the central claim, these are the main points, and be thinking about that with your own thesis statement. You should be asking yourself, what are, what's my central claim? What are my main points? And that is what I'm going to ask you to do in your thesis statement submission that you're going to do through Canvas that's going to be due soon here. You'll be identifying the claim, you have the topic, the central claim, and then your main points as well. So I hope this helps to clarify the textbook jargon and more importantly that it sets you on the right path for understanding how to generate your own thesis statement through research and then just the nuts and bolts of putting it together. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.